order. I have a brief statement to make of a valedictory kind. Now order. Now that the date of the general election is known, I hope the House will allow me to end my speakership by expressing briefly a word of appreciation and thanks. First of all, to all the members of the House for their consideration and for their kindness to me, and also for their support. I am well aware that a good speaker is a speaker who called you today, a bad speaker is a speaker who did not call you today, and, and sadly, a very bad speaker didn't call you yesterday. But, but I, the, the leader of the opposition, when I was re-chosen speaker in 19... 87 came to my rescue by saying that sadly no member in the house can expect to be called on the day he wants and the time he wants and on the subject that he wants. <laughs> Thank you for the opposition for that. It is a sad fact. Well, I think the public should know. It is a sad fact that uh, given the arithmetic, no member can expect, uh, fairly expect, uh, to be called more than four times a year in a major debate. And all I can say to honourable members is that I have endeavoured to be even-handed and fair yeah. and uh, yeah. some members will know that uh, if I feel I haven't been entirely just I have sent them a little note saying what about a free kick uh, at the next debate or at Prime Minister's question time <laughs> that happened over here today <laughs> order now the speaker carries heavy burdens and I shall always be in debt to my admirable deputies, to the Chairman of Ways and Means, Harold Walker, to Sir Paul Dean, and, and to Betty Boothroyd, for their loyalty and for their dedication and for their friendship. The House should know that Sir Paul Dean has served as Deputy Chairman of Ways and Means and Deputy Speaker longer than any of his predecessors since the post was created in 1902. Yeah. I must th also thank my personal staff. Uh, Bill Beaumont, who is my first secretary, and Peter Kitkat now, uh, and to all who serve so loyally uh, in the Speaker's House, I thank them for their support and their, assist their assistance throughout the nine years that I have been privileged to occupy the chair. My thanks also go to the clerks of the House, especially to Sir Charles Gordon for his guidance and advice when I first stepped into the chair in 1983, and to Sir Kenneth Bradshaw, and now to Sir Clifford Bolton, who I believe history will record to be one of the great clerks of this House. Yeah. The clerks serve not just the Speaker, but every member of this House. And I thank them all, not only for their help to me, but also for their help to all of us. I am sure the House would also wish me to express my gratitude, our gratitude indeed, to those who serve us here so faithfully. Some 4,800 people work in the Palace of Westminster daily. And on behalf of the whole House, I send my thanks to all of them. Yeah. To the Sergeant at Arms and to his staff, to the police and the custodians, to the library and to the boat office, to Hansard, as I have often said in the House, they make our speeches sound perhaps even better in print than they sometimes do in the chamber. <laughs> to the Finance and Administration Department and to the Fees Office, to the Parliamentary yeah. Works Office. <laughs> well, to the Parliamentary Works Office, and not least, uh, to the refreshment department yeah. whose members arrive early in the morning to give us breakfast and leave late at night long after we have parted. Finally, I hope I may be allowed to express my deep gratitude order to my wife Lynn. Yeah. The House will know that she is the first Mrs. Speaker for 20 years. Without her support and assistance in my duties, I could not have carried the burdens of the speakership, which are not confined to this chamber alone. Together, we have endeavoured to make the neutral territory of Speaker's House a place where party controversy is put on one side 
and friendship is encouraged. In achieving this, we owe a great debt of gratitude to the speaker's chaplain, the admirable Donald Gray, who, who in a very real sense has made the Palace of Westminster his parish. I hope that all of us who are leaving the House at this election will reflect that however modest our achievements may have been, it has been an immense privilege to be a member of Parliament. I firmly believe that the Speaker should always be elected for a constituency, as other members are, because in that way he is kept in day-to-day -day touch with the people who really matter, those who put us here to represent their interests. And I am deeply grateful to my constituents in Croydon North East who have elected me to serve them in Parliament on eight occasions since 1964. After the general election, others will take our place and we shall soon be forgotten. I hope that no government will ever forget or resent the fact that although they, it may have a right to get its business if it has a majority, it has to submit its policies to a group of elected representatives, many of whom may not agree and it is and will be Mr. Speaker's, Mr. Speaker's first duty in that process to ensure fair play. It has not always been easy, but it is an historic role on which rests the very foundations of our parliamentary democracy. So I take my leave, and in doing so, I express again my thanks to the whole House and to the staff of the House for nine busy and happy years, years in which I have consistently endeavoured to uphold the dignity of Parliament and the rights and the privileges of the members to represent the interests of their constituents here in the Forum of the Nation. Mr. Speaker, with the permission of the House, I beg to move the following motion that this House tenders its warmest thanks to the Right Honourable Bruce Bernard Wetherill for the skill and distinction with which he has maintained the traditions of the Speakership through momentous changes to the practices of this House. Thanks him for the genial and wise exercise of his authority. Records its appreciation of his fairness and tolerance in dealing with all members and unites in wishing him a long and happy retirement upon his departure from the Chair and from this House. Mr Speaker, for almost the last eight years, every formal speech or intervention which each of us have made in this House has been directed to you. In many of those cases, you have been the innocent medium for a message targeted elsewhere. <laughs> On this occasion, however, I, and I know others, Mr. Speaker, if they are fortunate enough to catch your eye, wish to speak to you directly and personally. Mr. Speaker, the end of this Parliament is an especially momentous one marked as it is by the departure of so many distinguished, right honourable and honourable members on both sides of the House. It is made all the more momentous by the departure of our Speaker. Mr Speaker, there is no office within this House more important than yours. It is an august and an ancient role. You are, I understand, the 154th Speaker. Over 600 years of history loom at your back. At your back, but never on your back. That sense of the past could easily have overwhelmed a lesser man. But in this house, we know it hasn't done that to you. It hasn't prevented you from developing your historic position to respond to the conditions of the present. And you have always done so in your own very individual way. Mr. Speaker, as no one knows better, you have to govern this house in accordance with a host of rules some laid down in the minutest detail, some apparently set in stone. But so much of the smooth running of this House depends on a wise interpretation of those rules. You have provided over many years the necessary wisdom to keep this House on the right path. You've known when to turn a blind eye and when to be eagle-eyed. You've known when to be stone deaf and when to swoop on a muttered sedentary interjection at 50 yards. <laughs> You've known when to exercise a short reign and when to use a long lead. And above all, Mr. Speaker, of vital importance to this House, you have preserved the rights of the individual member, however new, 
however junior and from whatever party. Your impartiality has shown that despite your long and honourable service in the Whip's office, an institution for which I retain the greatest affection, <laughs> you have shown that one need not be terminally tainted by that pit of partisans when you leave it. <laughs> Mr Speaker, when you were first elected, my noble friend Lord Conebrook, then the Honourable Member for Spelthorne, said of you as Deputy Chief Whip, and I quote, Never did I hear him get angry, lose his temper, or even raise his voice, even though sometimes the provocation was great. I think, Mr. Speaker, that even after eight years, I can say the same, that you never got angry, never raised your voice, and never lost your temper. Well, as W.S. Gilbert might have put it, hardly ever, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> It has been your privilege, and perhaps, Mr. Speaker, sometimes your penance, to preside over our first televised proceedings. You are the first television speaker, and as a result, you've become a star, if not of stage, certainly of screen. Your appearance, your voice, are known throughout the whole world. And in wig and knee breeches, you're recognised from Perth to Patagonia, from Teesside to Tuvalu. And most tellingly, Mr. Speaker, not only are you known, you have become respected the world over as well. The arrival of television must have added immeasurably to your responsibilities, but you have borne them both lightly and with dignity. I believe that your performance has enhanced the reputation of the Mother of Parliaments in scores of countries and among hundreds of millions of people around the globe. The job of Speaker is a lonely one. You've had to shun the camaraderie of the tea room and the smoking room in almost monastic fashion. And it must, therefore, have been all the more important that you've had the active support of Lynn, Mrs. Speaker. Your joint hospitality in the Speaker's apartment has been a notable feature of your time in residence here, bringing immeasurable pleasure to all of your many guests. May I, Mr. Speaker, through you, tender our thanks to Lynn as well as to you. Closer to home, it's not only we who miss you, but your constituents in Croydon North East, whom you've loyally served since 1964. And despite the pressing demands of your speakership, I know that your constituents have had no cause to feel neglected. In future, you'll have more time to spend on the good works that you support, on your favourite golf and tennis, and on the hobby you list in who's who as playing with your grandchildren. And I know how much you must look forward to that. Nonetheless, I suspect you will be sad as you prepare to lay down the speakership. We too, Mr. Speaker, regret that you're going, but you've made your decision and we must respect it. But as you depart, I hope that you know that you do so with our respect, our admiration and our affection. You, Mr. Speaker, may miss the House. We, Mr. Speaker, shall certainly miss you. Yeah. <laughs> The question is the motion just proposed by the Prime Minister. Mr. Neil Kinnock. Five years ago, I was happy to congratulate you, Mr. Speaker, on your re-election to the Chair. Now it's my privilege to second this motion, thanking you for your impeccable service to this House and wishing you a long and happy retirement with your beloved family. In the past five momentous years, this House and the Office of Speaker have seen historic changes. Amongst them, as the Prime Minister has said, the welcome decision to televise our proceedings. I know that in the most fittingly non-partisan way you worked for that yourself. And you did so because of your strong commitment to democracy, your faith in the qualities of the House of Commons, and your determination that our proceedings should be seen as well as heard. There are some who warned that uh, television would merely increase the ability of the House to make a scene and to act like a herd. Uh, but thanks in large part to your authority and the gracefulness with which you've exercised it, the transition to television has been successfully achieved. So successfully indeed, that the House of Commons has changed neither for the better nor for the worse, which is the greatest accolade that could possibly be offered. Yeah. And uh, as an added bonus, Mr. Speaker, 
you've become transatlantically illustrious as a television star whose ratings in the United States of America, according to one of our newspapers, are better than those of Dallas. <laughs> I must say, Mr. Speaker, Croydon Northeast to uh, South Fork is uh, one small step for man, one great step for mankind. Mr. Speaker, we all have cause to be grateful for the great qualities which you brought to the chair. Necessary sternness, mixed with essential good humor, dignity of presence, combined with a complete lack of self-importance, briskness coupled with sometimes superhuman patience. And since over the years of your speakership, I've not had to jostle much to cast your eye. Perhaps uh, I can say without fear of contentiousness that the House congratulates you on your selection of speakers throughout the years. <laughs> these, uh, these selections are a combination of a com computer, which is uh, inanimate and fallible, and an instinct for fairness, which is humane, and whilst not completely infallible, infa is, like democracy, the best system we've got. Any rare feelings that may exist amongst members that your selection of speakers might on occasion have been marginally less than perfect, as you acknowledged yourself, must surely, like some economic forecasts, be blamed on the computer. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, like many members of this House, have valued your personal friendship and your generosity of spirit. We also cherish the resilience of a speaker who draws as frequently as he can public attention to his conviction, in your words, sir, that the behavior in this House is better than it's ever been in history, and we must never perpetuate the dangerous myth that it has got worse. When this House of Commons has a defender of such stoutness, the least that we can always do is to ensure that the dangerous myth never becomes even more dangerous truth. Mr. Speaker, you've brought unique distinction to your office. In time, there will probably be other speakers of the House of Commons who are vegetarians. It's likely that there will be other good tennis players and uh, good golfers. But it's stretching imagination a little too far to think that there will be another who will combine those uh, characteristics with a capacity for meditation, the ability to speak Urdu fluently, and the talent to measure, cut, and run up a suit for any poorly clad member. <laughs> Truly... It's, it's good. Truly, Mr. Speaker, jack of many trades and master of all that really matter. Mr. Speaker, you shortly take your leave of us and our sadness at your departure is mitigated only by the knowledge that you will derive huge enjoyment from having more time for yourself, for your interests, and particularly having more ch time to spend with your grandchildren. The real trouble is that you do not go alone. You take from this place, Mrs. Speaker, your beloved wife, Lynn, who has shown such qualities of tolerance and kindness that she's won the affection and admiration of all who have come to know her. You and she are true partners, and this generation of parliamentarians is fortunate indeed to have had the benefit of knowing two such very fine people. Uh, the Prime Minister said that the Office of Speaker is a lonely position. I think that may be less the case in uh, your speakership because of this relationship that you have with your wife. Not for you, the condition in which a previous speaker who shall remain utterly anonymous, had been in the office but a few weeks when a faithful old friend of his, a long-time journalist in this house, visited him for supper, just the two of them. And this speaker, this nameless speaker who was teetotal, <laughs> said to the journalist, well, there you are, I'll call him Ian for the want of a better name, there you are, Ian. <laughs> There's the cabinet. You know more about these things than I do. Naturally, I'm faking his accent completely. 
And uh, the chap we shall call Ian said to him, is it the case, Mr. Speaker, that even after these weeks of pressure and loneliness in this place, you still haven't been tempted, as other speakers may have been, to try a little tipple yourself? And the anonymous speaker said, well, do you know, <laughs> I've once or twice taken a little drop of whiskey with a little hot water and a bit of sugar. And you know, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we say thank you to you and to your wife. We say thank you to a very distinguished speaker and a very good man. We wish you many years of active and fulfilling retirement. The whole house will agree with me when I say you've most certainly earned it. Very yeah. yeah. Ashton, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I need add I need add very little to what has already been said by both the Prime Minister and the leader of the official opposition. They have said uh, much of what I would have liked to say, and I can therefore restrain myself by merely saying that I would wish to associate my honourable and right honourable friends on this bench with all the words that they have spoken. But there is one matter which I believe I should draw attention to. One of the jobs of the Speaker is to ensure that between the two great juggernauts that we often believe conspire to dominate matters in this House, it is still necessary to ensure that the voice of backbenchers, especially independent backbenchers, and the other parties in this House are clearly heard. And I know that you have set that as a particular task of your speakership. Both my colleagues and I, and I suspect many other backbenchers as well, are grateful to you for the work that you have done to ensure that our voice has been heard. <coughs> and we know some of the battles that have been fought on that matter. Of course, we have from time to time had our disagreements. It would be remarkable if we hadn't. Maybe it's one of the qualities of a good speaker that he should come under pressure from all sides but submit to none. Mr. Speaker, one of the special qualities commented on both by both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, one of the special qualities which we have all enjoyed under your speakership is the friendly family atmosphere which you and Mrs. Speaker have created in the Speaker's House. Those of us, and I guess it must be the majority if not every single member of this House, those of us who have enjoyed your and Mrs. Speaker's hospitality remember those occasions with very great affection. My colleagues and I, <clears throat> my colleagues and I join with others in expressing our respect and affection and in giving you our warmest wishes also to Mrs. Speaker for your future. You may be assured that you carry with you the gratitude of this House and, I believe, the respect of the nation. Yeah.